Hi, I'm Rebecca Ball Carcel. Let's take a look at an Emily Dickinson poem called I Taste a Liquor Never Brewed. Remembering that that's not her title, but it's just the first line, the line we use to refer to the poem. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not all the vats upon the Rhine yield such an alcohol. And I'll stop there. That's her first four lines, or what we call a quatrain, the first stanza, the first group of lines. Now, what does she mean, I taste a liquor never brewed? Well, she's going to explain a little more later, but already she's saying she's drinking this special alcohol that wasn't created in the usual way. You brew coffee, you brew beer, you create it. That brewing is the process by which you make the, the alcohol or, as she says, the liquor. So this is a special liquor that's never been brewed in the normal way. And she's drinking it. I say she, but the speaker of the poem doesn't really have a gender. <clears throat> but I'll just keep saying she. She drinks from a tankard. A tankard is a big mug. So it's a stein almost, like a big beer mug. So I taste a liquor that's never been created the normal way, never brewed, from a tankards scooped in pearl. Pearl is um, the white luminous substance made by mollusks uh, that create pearls, the jewel, you think of a string of pearls. So this is this white luminescent, beautiful, valuable substance. And to have the mug, the tankard, scooped in pearl Mm, is this a metaphor? Does she mean it's um, frothing over with light or with something in nature like clouds, something white? Or um, is it meant to refer to an emotion, so a beauty? Uh, we will keep reading and see if we get some more clues. So I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl, not all the vats upon the Rhine. Okay, a vat is a huge container for the liquor, the alcohol, and maybe I picture it being made of wood, but they make metal ones nowadays, but huge containers. So you have the um, wine growing region upon the Rhine River. So the Rhine refers to a river in Germany and the famous wines grown on that river would be stored in vats. But she says that not all those vats would yield, meaning would produce, would give such an alcohol, and she capitalizes alcohol. Emily Dickinson has her own way of capitalizing. So um, she capitalizes tankards, pearl, vats, rhine, and alcohol, as well as the first letter of every line. <clears throat> so important nouns get capitalized. And I would say that she capitalizes alcohol in particular because she's emphasizing it. And she ends that stanza with an exclamation point. So not all the vats upon the Rhine River would produce or would give an alcohol like this, this special alcohol. And we still don't know what she's talking about, what alcohol. But the next stanza answers that question. Inebriate of air am I, and debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. Okay, so what is she saying here? She's drinking uh, air, she says, inebriate drunk. She's drunk on air. Inebriate of air am I, I'm someone who gets drunk on air, and debauchee of dew, they both start with D, debauchee and do. A debauchee is a person who is engaged in debauchery. And debauchery is some kind of, you know, excess of sensory pleasures. And someone who is a debauchee is someone who's doing it, uh, doing those pleasures. It could mean um, a libertine, someone who's recklessly indulgent. So she says, yeah, I'm indulgent because of dew, dew on the grass, dew little bits of water droplets that condense on the on surfaces in a on a morning that's kind of uh, cool or foggy. 
So dew is what she's drunk on, and air. Reeling through endless summer days. Reeling is like um, tumbling through the summer days. Or um, because she's talking about being drunk, maybe she's talking about weaving, not walking steadily through the summer days. From inns of molten blue, an inn is a hotel or if we're thinking of places where there are pubs or uh, bars in the bottom floor and then there are rent rooms for rent in an upper floor, that would be an inn. So the inn for her is not a normal little um, like hotel with a pub in the main level. This inn for her is, um, or tavern is another word for inn. This inn, though, is molten blue. Mm, so she's probably talking about the sky. Molten blue is a very brilliant blue. Molten would be a melted metal. So the blue is somehow very intense. So this is intense experience, but it's experience of nature. Summer days are making her drunk. The air, the dew, and the blue of the sky. So that's stanza two. I'll point out that she uses a lot of dashes, and this is typical of all Emily Dickinson poems. The dashes signal to the reader to pause a little more. She's sculpting our reading of the poem as we go through. She wants us to emphasize certain words and, and slow down for certain sets of words. Um, and if you see it on the page, which I hope you'll find and look at it and read it, you'll see that uh, she ends this stanza after Molten Blue, she ends that stanza with a dash. She's trying to say that th in a way that doesn't end, that experience that she's talking about just, just hangs there for the reader. There's no period right there. Next stanza. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more. There's a little humor here, let me explain. When landlords, okay, what are landlords? Um, the landlord is the person who owns the inn or the pub uh, that we were talking about where you might go and have a drink. So the landlord is in charge of who gets to be in his place, you know, in his pub, in his tavern, in his bar. And if you get too drunk and you're drinking too much, the landlord might tell you to leave and kick you out. And so she says, the landlord, when landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door. Foxglove is a flower, the bee is getting drunk in the flower, and the landlord is turning out the bee, saying, eh, you got to get out of here. You're getting too drunk on the flower nectar. So again, with the nature imagery, um, she's saying, I get drunk on air, or the speaker is saying, I get drunk on air and dew and summer days and the sky. And when landlords will kick the bee out of the foxglove, the flower's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, so when butterflies say, no thanks, I've had enough of my drams, a dram is a little drink, because of course butterflies also drink nectar of flowers. So bees drink, butterflies drink from flowers. And she says the landlord, which would be like nature, is saying, oh, that's enough, you know, uh, you're done. So when bees stop drinking and butterflies stop drinking, I shall but drink the more. So I'm not going to stop drinking. I'm going to keep on and on and on. It's a um, ecstatic poem in a way. Uh, the speaker is saying, I love being drunk on nature and I'm not going to stop, even though the bees have to stop and the butterfly has to stop. And why would they have to stop? The landlord or Mr. Nature or Mother Nature will make them stop uh, drinking from the flowers because dark is coming, the night, or maybe the season is changing, you know, winter's coming. But the laws of the land kick them out of the flower, but they can't make the speaker of the poem stop enjoying nature. Okay, so last stanza. 
until, so I shall but drink the more, until seraphs swing their snowy hats, and saints to windows run, to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. So seraphs, angels, the highest order of angels, in fact. So until the tariffs, seraphs swing their snowy hats, lots of S's, seraphs swing snowy hats. Again, with white imagery, we had the pearl that was white and, you know, brilliant or luminescent. And now we have these angels who are said to have snowy hats. So maybe we're referring to winter again, or maybe we have more of a uh, image of the wings of the angels being like hats. Uh, seraphs are said to have three sets of wings and one set of wings covers their face and their eyes. So um, maybe that's configured as a hat in the mind of the poet here. Uh, but something about angels acting this way, swinging their snowy hats, and saints to windows run. So at this time, when she says, I'll keep drinking until the angels are swinging their hats and until the saints run to their windows to see, what do they see? The little tippler, meaning herself. The speaker of the poem is a tippler, meaning a, a drunkard or someone who who drinks at least socially. Tippler is a little less harsh than drunkard, you know, or alcoholic. Tippler is someone who drinks, for sure, and gets a little tipsy, tipsy tippler. You see the relationship there? Um, so it's not as harsh as that, but still she's drunk on nature. Uh, and so now the angels are swinging their hats and the saints are running to the windows. Are they windows in heaven or windows on earth? In any case, the saints are running to see the speaker, our little drunk one, who's leaning against the sun. Wow, so this has transcended earth nature because now she's actually leaning against the sun itself, uh, which, of course, would not be possible in real life in any way. But in a, an imaginative way, she can be drunk on air and dew and sky and then contact the sun itself, lean against, touch the source of all of that life that proliferates on the earth, the source of warmth, of summer uh, and growth, of course, and, and all the vegetation of the planet and the animal life. So she's right up against the source, leaning against the source. To me, that's an ecstatic idea. It's an ecstatic image of coming into contact with this source of life. Mm. Okay, so, wow, Emily Dickinson is intense. Far from being just polite and pretty, this poem is kind of graphic in <laughs> comparing her enjoyment of nature to the enjoyment of liquor, of a forbidden um, substance, a, a potent substance, and that she is imbibing that. She's drinking it, soaking it up, and even contacting the source of it all. She, she's completely plastered <laughs> in the sense of being at one with the source of all life. Yeah. Uh, so I won't repeat myself more, but um, I'm really enjoying those images. Um, let me say a technical thing about the poem. Like a lot of Emily Dickinson poems, the rhythms of the poem follow the same rhythms as famous hymns. And Dickinson coming from a, a religious family, a Protestant Christian uh, context, she knows songs like Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, eight syllables. That matches her line, I taste a liquor never brewed. Just, she, she maps those familiar rhythms from her own uh, exposure to music of the church right onto her poems. The second line of Amazing Grace, um, how, uh, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me, maps right onto from tankard scooped in pearl. So she's using uh, the 
8686 pattern. Um, she keeps that through the poem, and she also does that in lots of other poems. I mean, there might be some variation in particular lines, but um, I mentioned the dashes before and how she puts a dash after molten blue as if letting the experience continue. She also puts a dash at the very end of the poem after sun as if that experience also is just, you know, has opened into some, you know, echoing in the reader's mind. It doesn't end with any finality. It just opens out with the dash. Um, another thing to say about this poem is that she wrote more than one version. So in your textbook, or if you look online, you'll see other versions of the poem. She revised a lot, and she has several endings for this poem. One of them has a um, flower referenced rather than the sun. I like the sun version. It's more grand. You know, it, it moves out of just the regular nature and into this celestial heavenly meaning outside of the earth's atmosphere you know it moves us out there with the the setting the setting of the poem moves out into space you know but the other version is very beautiful and it re uh, references a flower instead um so there are different versions and it just shows emily dickinson as a reviser you know, that she wasn't satisfied with the first idea that came into her head or even the first idea that would rhyme and fit into this 8-6 uh, syllable scheme. She kept thinking of more ideas that would say something slightly different each time about rhyme. So uh, pearl alcohol, mm, that's a close to rhyming, but f works for me. I mean, it ends with the L sound. Uh, do and blue, door more, run sun. She has more traditional rhymes later on, but she's not afraid to have a rhyme that's a little bit uh, off or, or we might say just not exact. She's comfortable with that and lets the reader uh, deal with it, enjoy it, perhaps. She takes that freedom, gives herself that license, and I'm glad she does. Okay, well, you might have thoughts about the poem. Leave them in the comments. And thanks for joining me for another Emily Dickinson poem.